ready to celebrate. He is risen. Amen. Will you put your hands together with us?
Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. If you would be seated for just one moment, welcome to Easter services here at VNC. My name is Eric Wood. I am one of the pastors here, and I just want to say thank you for choosing to worship uh, with us today. All of you that are joining in person, and also all of you that are joining online. What a great day that we can gather together, that we can celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. This is a really good day. We want to just take a second and and if you are new to VNC, maybe you're checking this out for the very first time. Thank you. It is an honor for us that you've chosen to, t to take one of the biggest celebrations in the life of the church and, and spend that with us. We don't want to miss an opportunity to connect with you. If you would do us a favor, right there on the screen on both sides, there's a QR code. If you take out your phone and just scan that code and fill out a little bit of information that gives us a chance to be able to connect with you. And right after service, if you have not done so yet, if you would join us in the foyer, there's a place called Guest Central. We have a small gift for you. We want to be able to just say thank you. We have something for the parents, the adults. We have something for your, your kids. And so we just ask that you would stop by there right after the service. And then next week, if you're maybe wanting to check out who we are, want to take the next steps here at VNC, we've got something called Lunch with Leaders. And that's just a, it's really just a free lunch after service, after the second service next week with some of our staff. We get a chance just to get to know you, but also for you get to know us and just ask questions and, and share a meal. And it's really a low key time to be able to know more about who we are at VNC. There's a lot happening in the life of the church. And today, Easter Sunday, gives us permission, gives us the ability to be able to gather on a regular basis, that we are people of the resurrection next week and the week after. And today just happens to be the fact that we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. There's lots of opportunities to be able to grow in your relationship with Jesus and to take those next steps. We've got some events coming up and some classes for you to be able to jump into some, some smaller groups group opportunities to be able to gather with other people, and we encourage you to look into those. If you, there's a place on the, on the screen for some things coming up. If you want to just click on that, on that link, if there's a, on the handout that you receive, there's also places for you to, to connect there as well. But look for those opportunities to take those next steps, whether it be through baptism or maybe child dedication, joining us for lunch with leaders next week. There's a lot of ways to take that next step in your spiritual journey. Thank you for being here. We are so excited to continue on in worship. We're going to sing a couple more songs. We're going to spend some time in prayer. Pastor Sean's going to come up and share a message of hope today and, some, and just have a great opportunity to continue on in celebration. So if you would, let's go ahead and stand back up. And if you would, find someone near, near you and just welcome them to worship this morning. Thank you, all of you online for worshiping with us, jump in that chat. Make sure that people know that you're there. Wish somebody a happy Easter, but thank you for joining us as well. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures, and he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we look forward for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
to give him praise for all he's done this morning. Sing this out. And see on the hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me, my Jesus set me free.
And you may be seated. Uh, we're going to go into a moment of prayer. And uh, man, as we go into prayer, I just want to invite you. And those of you who believe and you're following Jesus, man, you've sang songs with passion. You sang those words because you know what it means to be alive in Christ. And I also got to believe on a day like today, maybe there's some of you that are here, and I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something courageous and brave. Would you lay aside your doubts, lay aside your fears, lay aside your cynicism, and just for a moment, if these moments that we have together, to open your heart, to open your heart to a God who loves you more than you could ever imagine, who loves you so much that he sent his son to die on a cross because he loves you. And then rose from the grave to let you know that he is who he says he is. 
And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that's available to all of us to live a life following him. See, that's the kind of God we're talking about as we spend time singing about him and hearing from the word. A God who not only loves you to bring you into almost like a big bear hug, but a God who promises to walk with you every step of the way. So we're gonna pray. And even if you have never prayed before in your life, I would encourage you to have a conversation with a God, even if that conversation is filled with the doubts, the fears, and the cynicism. And just ask him to just speak into your heart today. Let's pray. Well, Father, we do come to you right now, and we are unbelievable grateful for what you have done. We're not just grateful for the cross, I'm grateful for the empty tomb, I'm grateful that you love us to the level that you do. And that you invite us to come and live a life that, well, I'm pretty sure it's how life's meant to be lived. So God, I pray for us all in this moment, whether we're watching online or, or gathered in this room, that we, well, you would help us be open to you, that you would help us be open to whatever you may want to speak into our lives this morning. Whether you already started uh, speaking to our heart through a psalm or in the moments that we're going to get into your word, God, I just humbly ask for an outpouring of your presence that's very real, tangible. God, we pray for people that are gathering all over this world today, that they too would have such an encounter and an experience with you that would remind us that you are alive, that the tomb is empty, and that we are loved, and that we can put our trust in you. God, I pray that this morning would be moments where people would come alive, spiritually alive and renewed, and finding life, life that can be lived to the fullest. So would you walk with us in these next few moments through your word? Would you walk with us in these next few moments as we sincerely open our hearts to whatever you may want to say? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is just a privilege to get to hang out with you guys today. And we as a church, if you're a guest with us, I just want to remind you again, Guest Central, uh, after the service, swing by there. We have a small gift we want to give you. We have a small gift for the kids as well. And just want to thank you for being here today. If you're with us online, man, hop into the chat and say hello. Uh, if you um, brought tithe or offering today, uh, you will see boxes near the doors. They're, they're little black boxes. That's a place where you'll see people putting their tithe and offering in there. Just continue. Thanks for your generosity. Uh, this, this place is a generous place, and we just want to thank you for honoring God in that way as you do so. Well, on this beautiful Easter Sunday, uh, we are coming to the end of a series that we started several weeks ago. And it's all about the beauty of Jesus and trying to understand who he is more and more. And so as Pastor Sean comes, will you just open your heart to discover even more today of just what the beauty of Jesus is? not only means, but what it can do in your life. Well, as Pastor Keith has already said, we, we are wrapping up this series today on Easter, this beauty of Jesus. And it is, over the last seven weeks, we've really kind of been diving in and kind of pulling it apart and looking at some of the things that really made Jesus beautiful. And, and one of the things was his connection to the Father, that he would stay connected to the Heavenly Father and he would peel back at times and just, I need to pump the brakes on my life and, and the ministry of what was happening just to stay connected to the Father. It was the way he, he showed empathy to people, that he really saw people that were hurting and needed him. The way he took and he reframed power and made it more of a kingdom um, thing than just an earthly conquer, and, and the way that he modeled grace and obedience to the Heavenly Father, and the way that he just resonated of who he was, he became the standard for all truth. No truth can exist outside the framework of Jesus. And Jesus modeled real 
beauty to us. And even though, even though he didn't you know, really meet traditional beauty standards, it's nothing that people said that, oh, this guy, when he walked in, everybody lit up. It wasn't like that. And, um, you know, if you were with us Friday night when we were talking uh, in this room, we were, we were having our Good Friday service, I, I told you that for me, it's a little awkward at times that, because I feel like we should be somber, we should be remorseful, there should be a, a moment where we kind of take it all in because it's, it's Good Friday and it's, it's the crucifixion and, and this is a tape, but it's kind of hard because we do live in 2023, so we know the outcome. We know, we know what really is taking place. So it's hard still not to be a little giddy. It's, not, it's hard not to get a little excited because we know that just a few days we'll be celebrating the resurrection. Although the resurrection's already happened. So he, even though we, we, you know what I'm saying? It gets a little awkward. Well, today, as we talk about this, the real beauty of Jesus, I'm gonna propose that there's another issue we kind of have. And it's, it's, there's a tension I, I feel it. Now, maybe you're going, I, I don't know what you're talking about, but I, I, I feel a little bit of tension on Easter Sunday. And, and we're, we're gonna dive into this as we look at this and this, this beauty of what really took place, this, this tension between why Jesus went to a cross and, and, and how this all played out. Well, even though he didn't meet traditional standards of beauty, Isaiah described the Messiah. In Isaiah 53, just a couple hundred years before Jesus said, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and, and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him in low esteem. So Jesus, even though we're talking about this is a beautiful Jesus, he was not necessarily what we would think of in Hollywood glamour or what we would think of in just eye-popping. This person walks in and everybody goes, ooh, look at him. That's not the way it was. Even though he was what we would say is this perfect example of beauty, humanity did not see it that way. Culture did not see it that way. His beauty was not physical. It was a beauty that permeated from him. It's what made him beautiful. And the most beautiful thing about Jesus is the tension that happens at the cross. He was able to take the cruelest form of execution at that point in time in history. A symbol of shame, humiliation, embarrassment, cruelty, pain, anguish, and he made it beautiful. He took something that was designed for torture Something that was designed to, to set an example. He was, it was something that was feared. That if you saw, if you were coming down the road in ancient days and you saw a cross on the side of the road and there was someone hanging on it, you avoided it. You didn't want to see that. It was ugly. It was terrible. It was beyond my comprehension. But he took what was that symbol that was feared and we now wear it as jewelry. In fact, it's now a sign of hope. It's a sign of peace. And nothing could be more violent than the cross. I mean, the scenes that we would see of Christ's suffering, the cruelty of what he endured, if it was shown, if we really saw and how graphic it was, I believe it would horrify us and probably give us nightmares. I mean, it would be impossible to really understand it fully. I'm just not sure we get it because the wounds, the scars, the, hum the humiliation, all of it. So this process of the cross creates a tension. It creates a tension for me. And I, and I know, I, I know that it, we, we are a celebratory people. It, we, we are living in the resurrection. But there is a tension that I'm dealing with. May, and maybe you're dealing with it too. I mean, so the beauty of the Christ, cross is fine, but the cruelty of the cross is repulsive. So we got to kind of deal with this. There's this, this, this horrific side of it, this terrible side of it. And then the tension is, it is because of my sin, it's because of your sin, he had to go to the cross. 
It is because of me. It's because of you. So as we talk about the celebration of, ooh, he's risen, yes. But the tension I have is dealing with my emotions over the fact that it's my sin, it's your sin, is why he had to go to the cross. Every person is partly responsible for the cruelest crime that ever took place on the planet. We're all accomplices. We all had a hand in it. We may not have been at the trial. We may not have said, give us Barabbas. We may not have said, I'm washing my hands. We may not have been Pilate, but we're still guilty. It's my sin, your sin, that's why he's there. So I live in this tension today that I want to celebrate the resurrection, but I still have to deal with the fact that it is my life that led to why Jesus had to go to the cross in the first place. And maybe you are dealing and wrestling with the same tension that I am. I mean, I don't want to face up to the fact that it was my sin, but it's reality that I'm, I'm partly responsible for what Jesus endured. And so when we start thinking about that, really, and we kind of wrestle into that tension, then it, when, we, when we see the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples, you've got to pick up your cross and follow me, then it means a little bit more that your life, my life, is not going to be just walking through the gardens that, G, that God created in the very beginning of time, that we may have to walk through really hard things, really difficult life situations, so it's easy to understand that we get squeamish about it. It's, it's easy to understand that there's a tension that maybe is brewing. And maybe you've never put words to it. You just know you kind of feel funny. But I believe God wanted us to really get this. That we had to kind of approach the horrors of Christ's sufferings in, in, in contrast to the, the resurrection because we had to get this. See, the Gospels devote more space in, the, in Scripture over the suffering and crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus than any other event, any other event of his life, more than his birth, more than the miracles, more than anything else. The four gospels really talk more about this part, what we're celebrating today. So it's important that you and I grasp the reality of the cross. It's, it, it's important for us to, to kind of spend a little time in the tension. It, it's, 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 it's in the tension where we gotta kind of hold on to this and look at it and deal with it. And I've got words of hope for you that it is in those wounds, it is in those scars, it is in the pain that we do find the hope. I mean, if you've lived long enough, if you've been around a long time and the older you live, the longer I live, you have probably collected your your own surgeries and stitches and staples and cuts and scrapes I mean, I have them. And sometimes your, your scars tell stories. Now, let me, let me just talk for a second. Ladies, let me just talk to you for a minute, and then boys, I'm coming to you. So ladies, here's the deal. I'd get it. I'm married. I've got a daughter. My son is married. I, I, I get it. Women, typically, you want to hide the scars because we say they're ugly. We don't want to show them off. We don't, we don't want anybody to know about them. No, that is, I get that. Boys, we want to show them off. You, you don't get a tattoo to cover it up. You want someone to see it. And a scar is a little bit like, a, it tells a story. It, it's like, you know, you, when you get your shoulders operated on, you start wearing tank tops all of a sudden. Because when somebody goes, what? Man, look at that. You had 13 staples in your shoulder. What happened? And then boys say, well, there's uh, I was at the zoo and a gorilla got free and I wrestled it. <laughs> See, boys have a way. We kind of like the story of the scars. And I, and I get, ladies, I don't blame you. You want to hide them up. Boys, we want to show you. We got, we got a story to go with it. I mean, when my son Jake, he, I mean, when he was ready to walk, so he was, he was little. He was, in, and no, now he's not here. So I'll tell you this. I didn't say it first service because he's sensitive. But <laughs> as a child, his head was four times bigger than his body. And it, he didn't walk to about kindergarten. He just wobbled over. 
and he may or may not have got shoved down when he was trying to learn to walk by his sister and her friend, but broke his nose. I mean, it was bad. And boys, black eyes, dads love that. We're like, look at him. He went through a meat grinder. You know, we do stuff like that. We just, because boys, that's, that's it. But like most boys, he had stitches. He, he broke stuff. It was unbelievable. And I used to tell him all the time, chicks dig scars. So when we'd go to get him, he would he'd kind of smile for a minute. And then when they started giving him shots, he'd start saying stuff like, I don't care about chicks, <laughs> you know, and get them to stop. They all prepped. I, and I, you know what I'm saying, right? You, you, you get it. it it's your, your stories kind of resonate with your scars. Your, your stories kind of permeate out of your scars. They, they tell us a little bit of something. I'm, I'm no different than you. I've, I've had staples and s- stitches and surgeries. I did that. My, my senior year in high school, um, the summer after we finished my junior year, I went to work at a golf course, a uh, country club, yacht club, golf course, and, and I, was in, I worked on this maintenance team. And so all summer long, we took care of the fairways and the greens, and learned to run all the different machinery, and we cut the grass. We did all those things. So all summer long, 5.45 a.m., I was at the golf course. We had to get everything prepped before the golfers would begin, and then we would, we would do different projects throughout that week and on Saturday, and we worked seven days a week. You had to work on Sundays, and I'd go in at 5.45. They'd let me off at 9.30 so I could go home and shower and get to the 10 o'clock service. And that was just part of, the, part of the deal. And I was so excited because it was going to be a great job. As, as anytime I wasn't in season in football or basketball season, they, I, would, I would go to work at the golf course. All I had to do was give them a call, say, I'm free this, these days. And they'd put me in and let me work. And it was a great opportunity for me to bank money to get ready to go to college um, at, just at the end of the year. And so I want to take advantage of it. Like many of you that have gone through the high school process, when you're your senior year, uh, when you get down to the end, uh, we didn't have to go to class that last week. We had already taken our finals and seniors, your part over, and then school graduation be at the end of the week. So I had a week that I thought this is an opportunity for me to bank some money before I head right into summer. And at $4 an hour, who can blame me, right? <laughs> 385 was minimum wage, but four bucks an hour, that's what they paid the maintenance crew. So I worked all week, 5.45 5.45 a.m. to 7 o'clock at night, 8 o'clock at night, whenever the sun would go down, then we would leave the golf course. And the day before my high school graduation, I'm working to the end of the day. I'm getting ready because that night is our senior banquet. And we're supposed to, uh, to be there, and they're going to celebrate all the seniors, and, and it was, it was going to be a lot of fun. But at the end of the day, while mowing, I was involved in this accident with this machine called a fly mow looks like a push mower but with two blades and it I slid down a hill and I cut my foot and my toes and I amputated three of my toes and so it's gnarly it was nasty now first service my dad's in here on the front row cackling (laughs) just losing it it and it it was hurtful I he had to I had Keith had to hold me in between services and so 30-some stitches later and, and ugly, nasty scars. But So the next day is graduation, and I, I was supposed to give a speech. It's a small school, about three people. I was the salutatorian. <laughs> I had to give this speech. They checked me out of the hospital to take me to my high school graduation. I'm in a wheelchair. I have an IV bag and a pain pump, which, just so you know, it worked. I don't remember anything about my graduation. I would show you the video, but it's way too embarrassing. As my classmates were in their robes, they draped mine across me. It was terrible. They wheeled me out. Why they thought this was a good idea, I can't tell you. They wheeled me out for me to give my salutatorian speech. And I said, thank you, everybody, and then bawled for 10 minutes. Just cried. Don't know why, just cried. And somebody at some point went, we should get him off the stage. And they wheeled me off, and I still just sat over in the corner and cried. I get back to the hospital. It's still your scars. They tell these stories. And, I, and one of the, my buddies that I played football with, he came and he brought me a gift. And 
And he came to my bed and, and he hands me this gift. And he goes, I, I think you should have this. And he goes, I've seen your foot. And I said, well, thank you. And, and I don't know what he's got in there. I open it up and it's, it's a package of Lee press-on nails. <laughs> he said, you're going you're gonna to need these. <laughs> and if you have lived any life at all, if you've lived any life at all, you have an inventory of accidents, bumps, bruises, and x-rays. You've got markings on your body of stitches and scars and staples. And that's just what's on the outside. But on the inside, you probably have dealt with wounds that we don't talk about. You've dealt with things on the inside that were unbelievably painful. And there are times in our lives we become known by our scars. I mean, when at the resurre- after the resurrection, a few days later, when, when the disciples had gathered and Jesus appears to them, it's, it's, it's Thomas who just says, I, I can't quite figure this out. And he goes, I, I, and Jesus appears and he goes, hey, you can put your, you can put your fingers in, in my wounds. You can feel my scars. And it's in that moment that Thomas believes. And it's, it's almost like in this tension that I'm talking about, this tension between it's, it, it, the crosses, he, made, he took the ugliest form of death and made it beautiful because it brings me life. Yet the tension is, it's my sin that put him there. And so as we kind of work through that, The beauty of Jesus at the cross is in the midst of the ugly and grotesque. It's in the middle of that that we get hope. It's in the middle of that that we live as resurrected people. And see, John was one of Jesus' disciples, and he was in the distance taking care of Jesus' mom, Mary. And he is watching and witnessing. And so when you hear these next couple passages, do it in light of this has already happened. That he has witnessed this. He has witnessed the ugly, the grotesque. He has witnessed the beauty. And he has dealt with the tension that it was his sin that put him there. He's dealt with it. So in John 1.14, this is what we get. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only son who came from the father. Full of grace and truth. So John would have stood and watched in the tension of the beauty and the tragedy. He would have stood and watched next to a place called the skull, the city dump. The smell of death would have permeated around it as an innocent man named Jesus hangs on a cross. And it would have been John that would have been witnessing to when he would have thought this would have been a chance. It would not have been uncommon for somebody to plead for mercy on the behalf of those on the cross. But Jesus takes the ugly and the grotesque and makes it beautiful because he doesn't ask for mercy for himself. In fact, he extends mercy and grace to you and to me. Those that are dealing with the tension, he says, God, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. John would have seen that. John would have heard those words and it would have humbled him. It would have have humbled us. If we would have been right there, right now in that moment, it would have taken us back. It would drive us to our knees. So in the truth, in the truth of this, it all happens in the midst of darkness. In Matthew 27, it says this, verse 45, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. So it's when John is seeing this, hearing this, witnessing this, the smells of the cross, the smells of the city dump, the, the tension that was resonating right there, the harsh realities of the cross became beautiful. Not from anything John did, not from anything John accomplished, not from anything you did or I did. It was all from what he witnessed and God's glory, his beauty, his power. And John goes on to explain in verse 9 of that same chapter. And remember, it's in the midst of the darkness, then John writes this. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world. He was made through him. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. 
Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. In the midst of the darkness, it is John writing, Jesus was the true light. He was the true light. He was saying, and that's, that's when, so when Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and it's, I've always been there. I was there in the beginning. So only Jesus, only Jesus could make death beautiful, especially death on a cross. His beauty changed the world. What he does there changes everything. He appeared to us seemingly without beauty that no one would have picked yet made all things beautiful. Because of his life and death and resurrection, it gave us hope of a preferred future. The tension that we feel between the agony, ugliness, grotesque of the cross versus my sins or what put Jesus there, how do I deal with that? It's, it's, this, it's this. It's because if you believe in Jesus and you are a follower and you say, Father, forgive me, then we no longer have to carry the guilt or the shame. The tension moves away to celebration. It's when we walk around as people with guilt and shame that have not asked for forgiveness, we will deal with this tension all the time. So if Easter is the time you, because it's just a ritual to be here, then it's kind of a little bit of misery. Kind of, it's a little bothersome. But when you live as resurrected people, we don't have to carry the guilt. We don't have to carry the shame because once we ask for forgiveness, it is gone because he prayed for us on the cross. Forgive them for they know not what they do. And John would have heard that. And he goes on to write in, in uh, three, two more chapters over a verse that if, if you've memorized any scripture at all, you've probably memorized this scripture, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But there's more to that little section. And it goes on to say, for God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world to make us not guilty. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believes stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. And this is the verdict. Back to the light. The light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth, comes into the light, so it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So today, so today, you can live in a peace and freedom as resurrected people without the shame, without the guilt, no matter how you came into the room or however you're watching with us online. And you may be taking a little bit of inventory of your scars, past hurts, surgeries, abuse, abandonment. You may be thinking about the scars that nobody could see, that maybe the one you love the most in the room sitting next to you doesn't even know about. You may be taking an inventory about the pain that's welled up inside of you, but I gotta tell you, you are not necessarily known by those scars. We can be known by his scars, by the pain that he endured. The, 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 the ugly grotesque of the cross becomes beautiful to us because once we ask for forgiveness, once we ask for forgiveness, the pain, the shame, it can go away. The beauty of the cross is it was for you and me. It was not nails and rope that kept Jesus on the cross. It was not the Roman soldiers <laughs> they, they didn't do it. He willingly went. It was love that kept him there. And if you hear anything today, make sure you hear this. He loves you. He chooses you. And he will forgive you. No matter what has happened in your life, 
He will forgive you. He will love you. And he chooses you. If you don't mind, would you stand? I wanna pray for you and then we're gonna finish with a song, but I wanna pray for you as we conclude this morning. Father God, thank you so much for the day you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you and to celebrate you. And Father, I just ask for those that are watching online, for those that are in this room, that they understand they don't have to carry the guilt and shame around. That we can live as free people. And we can live in peace with you. And so, Father, I just ask you to clear our paths that we'll choose you. We'll choose you. And, Father, we just ask all these things in your most precious and holy name. And everybody said... Now, this song we're about to sing is a celebration song. It says, you turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty to ashes. You turn shame into glory. And you're the only one who can. And you will turn graves into gardens. So today, as we conclude our Easter service, we want to sing this as a celebration of a resurrected Savior that he chooses you.
Amen. Hey, listen, we truly believe that there is nothing better than life than walking with Jesus. And we hope maybe today you took that first kind of a step. And we would love to walk that with you. you know, we talked earlier about the fact that nobody walks alone, that God walks with us in this, but you also need to know we're supposed to do this together. So if you've decided to follow Jesus, I got two thoughts for you. One is real quick, you will see on the bulletin they gave you, there's a place where you can just scan a QR code that talks about following Jesus, saying I, I've decided to follow him. Scan that, let us know, let us help you figure out more and more of what that means and how to live it. And just know we don't live it alone, we live it together. You also see so many other QR codes on there that are related to ways that you can take some of those next steps in your faith. And one of those next steps, baptism. And maybe you would be interested in being baptized as somebody who's decided to follow Jesus. Next week, after both services, we'll have classes that are set up to help you understand what baptism is a little bit more. And just a great opportunity to start letting people know, man, I've decided to follow Jesus. Now, maybe you're here today and you're going, I'm not scanning some crazy QR code. But you came with somebody. And somebody invited you here and they said, hey, would you hang out with me on Easter Sunday? And would you just figure out a way, be courageous, but would you just let them know before you even leave this room today that you would say just simply this, I'll give you even what to say. You can just tell them the tension is gone. And then let them celebrate with you and acknowledge what God has done in your life and let them walk with you as you figure some out, figure out more of what it means to follow Jesus. It has been so good to be with you today. If you're watching this online, would you stick around just for a moment? We got a special message just for you. But to all of us, happy Easter. And may you go and live life knowing that he is alive. Thanks for being here today.